sermon comes from this morning. Here now is the word of God. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is the word of God. Again, thank you for coming out and for being a part of the worship service today to the glory of Jesus. This is the day where we celebrate the table of the Lord and we (coughs) will be sharing the word first and leading into the table and then uh, we will celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection and promised ascension of the Lord and promised return after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, these elements speak to us in grand symbolic language today and we'll add to them as we go through the text. Chapter three, verses one through six, you'll notice some things about the text. First of all, Paul begins, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. This is a prayer section that suddenly just breaks off into a a different direction, and it's not picked up until verse 14, where he comes back, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So this is is a bit of an excursus. It's uh, suddenly Paul, by the Holy Spirit, after having stated verse 1, moves into this this, um, section describing mystery. And we're going to focus on that today. There's another thing to look into, and that is the very word itself, mystery. You'll see it is repeated in this passage. We see it recurs in chapter, in verse three, in verse four, and then in verse six. And uh, there are certain truths that stick to this word mystery, and we're going to discuss them today. So the word mystery in the Christian sense is a significant word to all believers. Its general meaning in this context is this, something hidden until made known by divine revelation. And uh, there are certain definitions of mystery in our culture that can divert us away from this. So we're going to dig into the text today and examine carefully this word mystery and the language that is attracted to it. The question that we have before us is, what is so important about the word mystery? What's so important about that word mystery? So let's pray, and then we will approach the text. Heavenly Father, in the glorious name of Jesus, we come before your throne And Lord, there is much between us and your throne. Issues of the week, current ponderings, lies we're telling ourselves, confusion, fear. There are so many obstacles in our minds right now And we ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you might kick out this stuff, 
that you would remove these things that keep us from hearing and seeing and acting by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, help me this day, your weak servant. Help me to proclaim the word of God clearly, and may we all hear it well and live by the power of the Holy Spirit in a better way. May the elements of the table be sweet on this day. May there be a sweet savor in our mouths as we partake of the elements that goes beyond the grape juice and the bread. May we have the sweet savor of the cross, the delightful taste of the things that delivered us the precious blood of Christ, the body of Christ broken. May these things be upon our hearts and minds, and may these truths carry us into the week to come. So now, Lord, have at us. Teach us. Show us. Expose our sin. Heal our souls. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. The text points to the word mystery, so we're drawn to that immediately in these six verses of Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul, the author, written about the year A.D. 60 from prison. Now, the, the word mystery in our culture, you might... Um, the word might be bouncing around in your mind, and you might be latching on to the word novel, mystery novels, some of them involving uh, murder novels. I, there's a, a person uh, who is a believer who writes murder mysteries and uh, is not well known yet, but uh, seems to do a pretty good job and holds the attention of the reader. You might be aware of Agatha Christie and her novels. You may have read many of them. And the murder novels, uh, they may have several volumes and then they'll stop because the author got tired of writing. One points to another and um, the readers are waiting for the next one to come out. You might be thinking of instances in your reading wherein you have encountered stories of people who have vanished, people who have disappeared, and there are mysteries around these disappearances. Some are solved, and some have good endings, and some do not. We remember the solution to the Jacob Wetterling mystery was solved recently, bittersweet, Many mysteries have this connotation. And then there are the mysteries attached to modern science. Um, popular mechanics produced a list of unsolved mysteries, and they wrote the mysteries in question form, and they said, well, maybe in the next hundred years these mysteries will be solved. For instance, is there a fountain of youth? Every morning I say no. Will there be a cure for cancer? I hope so. We pray to that end. Will we achieve immortality? There are some people who are saying in the prose attached to this question that sometimes scientists are treating aging as a disease. Well, um, that's interesting. And uh, can we create artificial life? Where is the soul? And I knew there was one scientist who said, I just read this again in the prose attached to the question, um, we have isolated the part of the brain that is responsible for religious affections. 
And I thought to myself, perhaps you are mistaken. Perhaps it is that part of the brain responsible for atheistic meanderings. How do we know? These mysteries, I'm not so sure if they will be solved in the next hundred years. Is there intelligent life in the universe after reading this article? I doubt it. Can we travel through time? Who would want to? So now we have to put all these notions to one side. They're not going to help us today because when we speak of mystery, the mystery according to the Word of God um, is something delightful. These, the mystery in the Bible is a mystery that is solved and yet is always fresh. We're not waiting for the next edition to come out. We're not overburdened by questions that have no answers and uh, that really put us in the place of God. So we, that's not the kind of mystery we're talking about today. We're talking about something fresh, delightful that has been solved and is for the benefit of the people of God and above all the glory of God. So what will help us today is to focus on the final, on a solved mystery, finally solved, and to focus upon certain other questions, uh, not to do with uh, meandering around the universe, but uh, these kind of questions, I'm going to pick one of them. Why, what is so important about the word mystery? What's so important about it? Why is it important to, for Christians to know the proper definition of this word or to understand more about what mystery means? Paul defines it in a unique way, and he defines it by gluing concepts to the word so we'll come to understand it and uh, delight in Christ because of it. So what is so important about the word mystery? Generally defined, it is something hidden until made known by divine revelation. Uh, this kind of mystery is solved and yet is always fresh. We don't need another volume. We don't need another edition. We don't need hype. Uh, we don't need uh, the power of humanity to to look for things that uh, apparently need to be solved and don't really have to be. In fact, they're in the hands of God. We need to focus on, and this word mystery is defined by Paul here in the text. So let's look at it. The first word is the word call, C-A-L-L, -L, and that is related to this word mystery. For this reason, says Paul, and what reason is this? It's the truth of being one in Christ, Jew and Gentile, one in Christ. And verse 22 of chapter 2, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the Spirit brings the people of God together into one body, whether they be Jew, Gentile, and the Gentiles can be every tribe of people all over the world. The people of God brought together, they could be from every tribe, and they're brought together, and isn't that quite amazing? And so for this reason, I, Paul, he writes, Paul, who used to be known as Saul. Saul was the name of this grand king of, of Israel, and now you have Paul, little Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Paul <clears throat> was under house arrest in Rome. He is there because of the preaching of the gospel. He's preaching the mystery of Christ. He's preaching the cross. He's preaching faith in Christ in order that we might have our sins forgiven. Before he was converted, not only was he known as Saul and had a pretty lofty position in um, in uh, Judaism, when he was well sought after. Note this in Philippians 3, 5 through 6. This is the kind of person Paul was. 
Philippians 3, verse 5. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So at one point, Paul was quite a guy. He was a, uh, a very well-educated, well-heeled person, and uh, now he is in prison for his crime of preaching the gospel. He was applauded at one time by people uh, in Judaism and people around him, and uh, <clears throat> now the very people who applauded him want him in prison. So that's Paul. He's not a prisoner. He doesn't see himself as a victim. He doesn't see himself as a prisoner uh, under Rome. He sees himself as a prisoner for the sake of Christ. Here's the point in that verse 1. He is a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. So he's speaking to the Ephesian church. He knows that they're uh, <clears throat> Greco-Roman. He's telling them that he's there because of the gospel. He's an apostle to the Gentiles, and he has gone to prison because of his willingness to sacrifice his privilege for the sake of serving Christ. Willing to sacrifice privilege for the sake of serving Christ. Giving up. No fear. No fear. I'm not going to do this because it's scary. Uh, uh, Paul didn't say that. He may have at some point. But he didn't say that to the point of turning back. He, <clears throat> he was willing to sacrifice all of that worldly privilege for the sake of serving Christ. This is the heart of genuine call. This is the heart of it. <clears throat> that which is used to proclaim the wonderful mystery from God is a call from God that delights in the privilege and is willing to give up the privileges of the world to do it. That is the call associated with the word mystery. Proclaimers of the mystery are called not just to be, a, you know, some Western um, flim-flam individual with certain clothes and certain hairstyles and all this kind of thing and proclaiming a little tiny gospel that is no gospel at all. No, this is call that is deadly serious. Giving up, willing to sacrifice worldly privilege for the privilege of of knowing Christ and proclaiming the message of the gospel. So here's the question for us. Paul identifies the word call with the word mystery. <clears throat> All understanding of that. So then, if called upon by God, are we willing to sacrifice our privilege for the sake of God's glory? And that's the question. I'll read it again. If called upon by God, are we willing to sacrifice our privilege for the sake of God's glory? That is proclaiming the mystery, and that mystery is Christ. And we're going to partake in the table today, and we will sense the mystery of that wonderful, wonderful table now there's another word along with the word call. What is so important about the word mystery? Well, it <coughs> highlights this word call. Mysteries, the mystery of God, involves people who were called by God, but it also involves this word, stewardship. S-T-E-W-A-R-D-S-H-I-P stewardship. Look at verses 2 and 3. 
<clears throat> Paul stacks up words in the Greek text. He stacks them up. And if you study uh, <clears throat> a good <clears throat> translation, you can sense it. A literal translation, you can just see the words piling up. And the reason why he's doing that is he is overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit with the revelation of God in the mystery of the gospel. Assuming, he says in verse 2, this is under the word stewardship. Assuming that you have heard, speaking to the Ephesian church, he says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace. What in the world does that mean? The word stewardship may be translated something like a management of call. So managing his call, a stewardship, his, his, uh, he was entrusted with a commission, and he was to be trustworthy in it. Trustworthy in his calling, in his commission as an apostle, as an agent of God, bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. So, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, he sees this as a gracious gift from God. That's what he sees. So, stewardship will continue through the verse. He was not to withdraw from that. He says, that was given to me for you. There's a particular reason for the stewardship or the commission. His management, his careful care of his commission was a was a calling, a part of his calling, the stewardship, and that came by God's grace. His stewardship, his work to do what God had called him to do by the power of the Holy Spirit, all of that seen as a gift from God. It was given to him for the Gentiles. He didn't earn it. Verse 3, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. What does he mean by that? Revelation, no doubt, is the Damascus Road incident in Acts chapter 9, 1 through 9. The Apostle Paul, breathing out hatred and murder against the church, went to the high priest, received letters from him to go to Damascus in order to deal with the church there, bring the people to Jerusalem in chains and to do his work as the persecutor, although he saw himself as an agent of God. So this Saul started off, and whom did he meet on the road to Damascus? But the King of kings and Lord of lords in this special uh, confrontation of heaven and earth, and the resurrected and the ascended Jesus condescended to confront Saul, and said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. He was confronted, and those who stood around him wondered, what's this all about? They could hear, but couldn't see. And then it says here in Acts chapter 9, if you'll note that, in Acts chapter 9, the apostle is confronted and he says this, note. <clears throat> Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Rise and enter the city and you will be told what you're to do. And so he gets up and Although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing, so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. And all he had to say was, Who are you, Lord? And then he came to the knowledge of this Lord. Galatians 1.12, Galatians 1.15-16, through 16, the Damascus Road incident is, is involved in the word revelation. So Paul was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, and the mystery began to unfold to him. And eventually he was called to preach in a very particular way to the Gentiles. 
Paul says it after the word revelation, as I have written briefly. This writing briefly of the mystery has been portrayed in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. And most likely in Colossians 1, 25 through 27. So then, intimately related to the word mystery is the word stewardship, which involves God's giving to Paul his mystery and the privilege to proclaim the mystery, the ministry and the privilege to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for the benefit of the saints and of the lost. So he's to proclaim. Intimately related to mystery is the word stewardship. God has given it. He's to care for it. He's to proclaim. He's to live to the glory of Christ. And the benefit of many. The saints will be encouraged and the lost challenged. What a great thing. Here's a thought. Related to the word stewardship, in what sense do we see ourselves as stewards of truth for the sake of others? In what sense do we see ourselves as stewards of truth for the sake of others? The first thing we must see, I have read numerous books on church leaders ad nauseum. But the best comment that I have read is this. If a leader does not have a heart for others, then that leader should not lead goats or hogs. Because the meat might taste badly. Lead nothing if there is no Love for other people. Stewards of truth. Love the saints. Love the lost. Don't be so caught up in ourselves. That's leadership. And I lack and I need prayer. Those who follow who too are called, who too have a stewardship. And the stewardship is very similar. And the question for all of us is this, are we willing to die to self and live for others in the sense of bringing the gospel to them? Are we willing to die to self and live for others in the sense of bringing the gospel to them. Living for others. Dying to self. What does that mean? I have a little booklet on my desk that Paul Drebelow gave me. And it's called Dying to Self. Written by an old, old an author who's long gone. <laughs> it's, I hate that book. Because what does it say? It talks about how powerful self is, how self says to us, love yourself. Love yourself. Care for yourself. Defend yourself. I overheard a conversation. I won't give you the whole detail because I just wanted to jump in front of traffic after hearing this. Young woman, young man, obviously on this date of some sort, I'm in a coffee shop reading, as I want to do. And oh my goodness, I don't know what this was. Some kind of a meeting of some sort, and first time meeting, and this guy blathered on for 90 minutes about some goo. And I thought, I'm going to throw the book at this guy. No, let me just try to love him and pray for him. And all of a sudden, in the midst of the conversation, this poor girl, all, all she could say was, yes, yes, oh, I see, oh, isn't that wonderful? And at the end, he said, I finally learned that I really love myself. And I thought I was going to stand up and say, that's obvious. Get away from this guy. What kind of a dating agency is that? 
Are you willing to die to self and live for others in the sense of bringing them to the gospel? Do you see such a living? Do I see such a living as a privilege bestowed by the grace of God? Stewardship. Stewardship. Management of call. Recognizing it as a gift from God. Something that is not self-focused, but other-focused. A great privilege to the benefit of others. That's stewardship. We see ourselves as stewards of truth for the sake of others. Thirdly, purpose and call us the effect of call. So we started off with call, then we had management of call, which is gift of God. All of this, we trust in the Holy Spirit, the call, the stewardship, um, managing it, uh, desiring what God wants, and trusting in the Holy Spirit for the ability to do that. Paul describing his his conversion and, and the mystery. We're going to highlight that now. I'm saving that till we get to the next point, and that's under purpose, the effective call. Look at verses 4 through 6, and we're going to come to the table. When you read this, he says to the Ephesian church, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Okay, he mentioned that in verse 3. Now in verses 4 through 6, you'll see it twice. You can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Paul wants the people to know what he knows. He doesn't want to keep it a secret. He wants to let it out. He wants to tell people what it is. Paul received insight into the mystery, the mystery that was disclosed in Christ it is in Christ that God's designs are revealed. Notice it's the mystery of Christ. It is a mystery that is centered in Him, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Apostles and prophets have already, already been mentioned in chapter 2. He's talking about when he says apostles, these are those, those first century guys. You have uh, the twelve, Judas having been replaced, and then Paul there. And you have these apostles, and then the prophetic office related to the apostolic office. First century this is a beautiful picture of God giving agents of truth to the church in this era. The earlier generations were not given the opportunity to delight in mystery. It was given only to these guys. Why are they called holy? Because they're set apart by God for their role as recipients of the truth for the people of God. That's why they're called holy. Set apart by God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, look what the, what the Bible says. Being revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice, verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Now he defines it. And the third word is therefore purpose. Here it is. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. All piled up. All these words. Amazing. So the third word that I want to bring to you is this. What is so important about the word mystery? Three words are glued to it that help us understand it and help us think about our own lives. Call. And there's the management of call, which is a call being a gift, and gracious gift, and the management of it is a gracious gift from God as well, as stewardship, and now purpose, which is the effect of call. The mystery of Christ, not made known to generations in the past, now being revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And this is it. 
Gentiles and Jews, believing Gentiles and Jews, are one, members of the same body, family of God, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, not outside of him, through the gospel, the gospel that calls people to repent, trusting in Jesus Christ, the good news, freedom from sin, forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. Here's the key. The apostles and prophets were the ministers through whom the truth was to be communicated. Christ is the sphere in which the Gentiles are incorporated. They come together with believing Jews, believing Gentiles and believing Jews together. And it's here in Christ that the Gentiles inherit the promise that was given to Abraham. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Here is a picture of promise. Verses 1 through 3. Now, the full flower of the, prom, of the mystery was not given in the Old Testament, but it was there in seed form. Chapter 12, verse 1 of Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, who had become Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in all the families of the earth, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham pointed forward to Christ. And now he defines, he doesn't say in Abraham now, he says in Christ. There's the fullness. So then the gospel shared by the church is the instrument through which God achieves his purpose of bringing Gentiles and Jews to faith and bringing them together in Christ. In the context here, the Gentiles brought together with the Jews as one body in Christ, not outside of him. Mystery rightly understood leads us to delight in the purposes of God in Christ, in uniting the believing Jews, believing Gentiles, and on those Gent with respect to those Gentiles, it's worldwide. Every tribe, every language, every people, group, the people of God are brought out from those places. Here's the challenge. Are we earnest about this purpose that comes from God? This is the purpose. This is the effect of call. You have the call, the management of call, and the effect of call. These, these things are stuck to mystery. We are a mysterious people. We have calling, we have stewardship, and we have purpose. And the purpose is what? It is this. In this question, are we earnest about this purpose that comes from God? Are we actively involved in some sense in proclaiming the gospel that encourages the saints and draws men and women to Jesus? Is that where our passion is? To draw to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit through the proclamation of the gospel, those people who are around us, not by our own strength, but by person of the Holy Spirit who works through our humble means. Are we actively involved in proclaiming the gospel that encourages the saints and draws men and women to Jesus? So what does the word mystery, of what does the word mystery remind us, call stewardship and purpose? We're coming to the table right now. Know this, it is not a good thing to move on to other min, uh, mysteries, given that this one has been solved. We don't have another mystery. This is it. This is the central mystery. It's always fresh. It's always delightful. We do the table once a month. It reminds us of this glorious mystery in Christ. It reminds us of call and stewardship and purpose. It reminds us that we're not here to benefit ourselves, but to lift up Christ. Delight in those around us who are brothers and sisters and reach the lost world to the glory of God. Pray that God might move in our hearts to delight afresh in the word mystery 
and that these words are, that are stuck to it will be sticking to us. Mystery is solved, and yet it's always fresh. There is a warning that goes out, a warning that goes out <clears throat> that we must, to which we must attend in the Lord's Supper. And this is it. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. It is a very serious thing to come to the table. We have thought about our hearts before God earlier in the service, and now we come to the table. 